Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience and see wealth differently. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market leading technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your business thrive. See wealth differently. Visit netwealth.com.au to learn more about how NetWealth can support you. Hello and welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. I am Fraser Jack and today we are tackling a series based on technology and innovation. Uh, we are going to cover some pretty pretty incredible topics. In this particular episode, we're going to cover off on all things around tech stacks. We're going to talk about uh, before, during and after the client journey. We're going to cover off on things like client portals and security. Uh, in the next episode, you'll, you'll hear us talking around uh, things like tech trends. Uh, episode three, we're going to cover off on content marketing. When we get to episode four, we're going to start talking about business strategy and all things that technology, how technology plays into the, your business strategy. And in the final episode, we're going to tackle innovation around where to from here. Where does the where does the evolution of all of this advice that we're using go from here? We're lucky enough to be joined by a wonderful panel of speakers for the series. We've got uh, Patrick Flynn, aka the Process Guy, uh, advice innovator from Simply Kaizen. We've also got financial advisor Haley Pierce from Caboodle Financial Services in Sydney. We have uh, AFSL technology and innovation consultant James Sutherland. We've got Perth based Cara Graham, financial advisor and director of an award winning practice TWD. And rounding it out, we have Joint Managing Director of NetWealth, Matt Heiner. Welcome, Patrick Flynn. Thanks for having me, Fraser. Thank you for coming along. Now, uh, let's start with a little bit of quickly about you and and your business at the moment, how you help advisors. Do you want to give us a quick overview? Sure. Uh, I've been working in advice in many capacities since 2005 across uh, right from the bottom of the organization, starting out as most do, up until being a uh, what I refer to as a rather mediocre financial advisor, um, because what I really enjoyed was the process. So I've done a lot of work in ops management at licensee level, and uh, now I spend most of my time consulting with practices on improving their policies, processes, and technology. Fantastic. Yeah, you absolutely do spend a lot of time working with practices. Uh, you also got a couple of other businesses you work on. Yeah, I've got a, a couple of other units. Uh, one is around websites. So we do a lot of work around website development for practices. We really try to create simple websites that are very efficient, uh, which ties in quite nicely with the other work we do. That's uh, what we call Simply Advice Websites. And then we've got another, uh, perhaps a half business, half hobby project of mine, which is called Life Goal Cards. And we use that as a, a series of tools, um, primarily cards, to help facilitate uh, conversations with clients around their goals. Fantastic! And so, uh, three businesses, and the and your first one's called uh, Simply Kaizen, which is which mm-hmm. which uh, is a Japanese word. Talk us through that. Yeah, so uh, it's a Japanese word uh, that was very much in vogue in 80s management, um, but nothing can be in vogue forever, even though it may be really, really good. Uh, And it's all about continuous improvement. So it's uh, Japanese for change and good, uh, but it's really become synonymous for that continuous improvement. So it's really not trying to necessarily change everything overnight, um, which I find uh, positions me a little bit differently to other consultants who often try and revolutionize things right away, but rather building a culture of change and a sense of change and iterative changes that means you can do small things today, which hopefully you learn something small today that you can go and take back and use as iterative improvements and then having a process for doing that continuously. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, you, so certainly uh, a, a fantastic guest to have on to talk about all the things we wanted to talk about in, in this particular series. Uh, now we're talking about technology stacks today and you work a lot with advisors and advice practices around the country uh, on mm-hmm. technology stacks. Um, let's start with the, with the conversation of technology stacks, uh, you know, that in the client advisor engagement process, uh, maybe before they become a client, um, sort of maybe that before pre-client marketing um, space. Mm-hmm. What what are you seeing in that space? Well, it's a 
Yeah, an interesting uh, area because first up, before you can really get into the technology, you've got to take it one step back and think about the process to a degree. So uh, we know that the the pre-sales process starts before we've made any contact um, and that'll involve, um, yeah, it might be some marketing material that's part of that pre-sales con contact uh it might be uh, just our website very simply or it might be you know a bit more old school it might be how referrals are made um that happens and it gets introduced to you before it even gets to you know anything you can influence as strongly as you can your own in-house process so there's a lot of stuff you need to consider there and when we're trying to break up our tech stacks uh one thing that people don't often fully consider is the importance of breaking it up between when a client becomes what I typically call a prospect, which is where I usually consider at the handoff point to be they've engaged you, they've contacted you, they'd be expecting a call from you, uh, they know your name, you've spoken. That's what I typically refer to as being a prospect. And then anything prior to that, I call a lead. Now, those terms are interchangeable. You can call them whatever you want to call them. Uh, I don't love the word lead, but it's certainly a tool, uh, a bit of terminology that a lot of the software use. Um, and I really try to break those things up because what's good for leads is not necessarily good for prospects um, and is probably not good for clients um, and vice versa. So in terms of what people are using, if we're using tools like HubSpot, uh, that's a personal favorite of mine. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool that really tries to capture everything about the client all the way from the get-go. So if you've been to my website and you've subscribed to my newsletter, I use HubSpot and I can, I can, I know what your IP is. I know what you looked at. I know how long you spent there. Um, or at least I know what IP address you accessed it from in any case. Um, and it builds on that. So it might be, I know your IP address at day one but you haven't subscribed to anything. You just read one blog and you went away. But then six months later from the same IP address, you came along and you read another blog. And then another three months after that, you came and this time you subscribed, um, which I hope you all do. And uh, when we do that, um, you know, we then can see, oh, you know what? I now know your name, but I always knew your IP address. So it links all of that data up and you can really see just that, that wonderful visibility right across the entire communication they've had with you where even though it might not be overt communication uh, the little breadcrumbs that the prospect or lead has left along the way uh, gets to accumulate uh, and then when you do actually engage you can know a fair bit about their interests or why they came to you in the first place beyond just what they stuck in a comments form in the inquiry section on your website so that's that's pretty cool yeah, now this is a really interesting um, subject because we, uh, most advisors will hear the word CRM and they will automatically think of, you know, one of the major financial planning CRMs, uh, <laughs> insert uh, insert logo or name here. Um, but when it comes to client relationship management, the CRMs actually start well before, as you said, that lead um, lead process or that um, mm. uh, uh, some marketers call it marketing qualified leads and then it moves to a sales yep. qualified leads is, is the technology that marketers would use. Um, mm -hmm. Some I've heard people say, um, suspect, then prospect, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, but you, you, which I quite like. That's a simple one. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, sometimes I, uh, I often use those terminologies based on what it says in the system. Maybe they're not the best terminology. And when you're working within your sales team or with your advice team, suspect and prospect works really well. Um, but then when you're working with the rest of your team and they've got to fill something in a field, and the field calls it lead or the field calls it prospect, yep. it's often better to just, you know what, lead's not the best term, but if the system calls it lead, let's just call it lead yeah. and not try to call it something funky. And it doesn't really make too much difference at the end of the day, as long as the no. clients don't understand that that's how you're talking about them. Exactly. As long as you're not sending emails out that have hi, lead, no name, um, <laughs> then you should be okay. <laughs> so the thing about this is that's the CRM which collects the data of the humans that are interacting with your website. So it's mm -hmm. not just a website standalone and a client relationship management system standalone. It's HubSpot is one that does the two together, correct? Mm. Yes, absolutely. And and so, uh, which probably leads us on to the conversation around websites and how important that digital online presence is. Um, you know, your client facing, your shop front, all those sorts of things. Tell us about uh, tell us about that because obviously you do a lot of work with websites. Well, websites are really critical, and where people often 
think of websites is in the marketing basket. And I don't think of them in the marketing basket at all. I just think of them as another piece of technology. And when you've got technology, it's up to you to see how you do it. A car can be a to something you have for fun. It can be something you have for transport. Um, it might serve cross purposes, of course, but it's what you want to do with it. Um, if you have any piece of technology, if you're thinking about the problems you have in your business, websites work really well as a centerpiece for from the client's perspective of what you're doing. So when you're thinking about your, your website, if we're taking a look and going, okay, great. First up, we're looking at the first person to engage us um, and we see we see all the the whole gamut of stuff where uh, we'll see advisors that just want to have something that's set and forget um, we'll see advisors that want to really use it as a content marketing resource we'll have people that use lead magnets to really capture people when they get there uh, we'll have people that actually don't really want much new business at the moment but they want to be ready to turn it on later when they feel they've got their internal systems and their uh, and their efficiencies sorted out. Uh, we'll even see people who are saying, you know what, I actually get a lot of inquiries and I just need to use this as a qualifying tool. I don't want to market with it. I want to manage with it. Um, so it'll be using functions like um, you know, apply to become a client or having people book online, but they have to pay for their first meeting or have to make a donation before they can get to their first meeting. Those sorts of things when you really think about a website like that just as a marketing tool is really understating what it can do um, but it is when it's done well really that centerpiece of how the client engages with you short of walking into the office or physically meeting you it's the next best thing they have to a centerpiece um, and it's really important that you invest in it um, to make sure it really feels like that centerpiece and then when you've got your website sorted a lot of the technology can be built around that. So if you're using a if you're using a platform like say a Wix, for example, which is free, and if you want to have really basic functionality, is a really great tool. And if you're just starting out and the budget's really tight, Wix is a really good option. Um, but it doesn't really integrate with a whole lot very well. It definitely integrates with some things, but as you start to sort of make things more and more complex, it starts to break down on you uh, and you start fit, hitting that ceiling. Um, if you use a tool like WordPress or if you go with you know, something really fancy like a customly developed solution, then there's a lot more that you can do with it and there's a lot more you can integrate with there. Uh, and if you're thinking about it as not just this just needs to market well, this needs to be our centerpiece, then you're really thinking about all those interplays that will have with all the different little bits of technology uh, and you're thinking one step ahead of how they're going to fit together, not just whether it's going to look good or load quickly or can do SEO. Yeah, it's a really interesting piece. And as you mentioned, it's not just a marketing tool. How do you feel about the idea that websites, um, as you mentioned, some some advisors might not be looking for loads of new business at the moment. How do you feel about the website being also the centerpiece for their existing clients? Absolutely. There's no different, differentiation in my mind. They're 100% the same. So, uh, for example, when I find myself repeating myself on a topic where I get a narrower question, then I'll, I'll write a blog about it. And then I'll direct both new and or both prospective and existing clients to that particular blog so that I don't have to repeat myself. So we've got one on there, there for example, it's completely website-based and it's around, um, uh, it's around team profiles on your website. I'd often get the question, should I include the whole team on there? Should I include the person who does bookkeeping for me one day a week? You know, these little trade-offs that are in there. And I've got a guide to exactly that, um, which means that now for even my existing clients, I don't have to answer that question ever again, because if I was to answer it, I'd spend two minutes answering it and they'd get a verbal answer as opposed to a 600 word reference point that they can forward on to their team members. Um, so I'm giving a lot more service by doing that. And it's really geared more towards my existing clients than prospective ones. The prospective ones just hopefully like it and you know use that as a tool to engage further. Yeah, fantastic. So it becomes a resource for your existing clients. Mm -hmm, 100%. Now, uh, you're obviously seeing a lot of space, a lot of stuff going on in, in when it comes to tech stacks in the advice process itself. So, you know, engaging, mm. you've mentioned, <laughs> we, we sort of talk about lead prospect, but once somebody becomes a client, talk to us about what you're seeing and how you're seeing advisors putting things together to create a stack around the advice process. So the advice process is many things. So before we jump into the, the elephant of the room of SOAs, um, 
you know, if we think about the other parts of the process, um, there's your workflows. Um, so there are lots of tools that can do funky workflow management. There is a point where you want to make sure that they're built into your CRM, um, I find. Whilst the best process management tools might be something external and it might have an API between them, there are limits to those APIs and you can feel yourself jumping from one tool to another tool. So whether it's a HubSpot or whether it's a financial planning dedicated CRM, making sure that you've got the workflow capability and functionality built out in your tool that you're using to manage your clients. The same thing that is the source of truth, I find is the best thing to do especially because those tools can be automated to update field values, trigger certain things, generate certain documents, send off particular requests. You really do want them all in the one spot. Um, in terms of what people are doing with those processes, just for example, if you want to go down the process road, Process Street is quite a cool one. Um, but you know, HubSpot have their own integrations um, and you, know, you can use something with a Kanban board style, which I've seen used quite well. So like a Trello or an Asana can do that quite nicely if that's really more your approach. Um, it really depends on whether how important visibility is to you and how important automation is to you. Um, Kanban board style ones, that's just literally a board where you can see the different stages of the advice and you can click and drag uh, you know, a card across those so you can feel like that thing is processing through and you can see whether something's getting stuck at SOA stage or is stuck at file note stage or something like that. Um, there's tools that do that, and that's the Trello and Asana. Um, the the ones where it's like a process street, or we use Lucid Chart for building out processes. Um, that's for mapping processes in particular, um, and I find uh, Lucid Charts really really cool for that. Um, so once we've got those mapped out, then it's a matter of what's in them, which is perhaps beyond the scope uh, of this topic. But uh, in terms of what people are using for generating statements of advice. That's a tough one. So where where I think the real big decision here for most practices is, do I have an all-in-one solution or do I have a standalone solution? Do I have what's effectively the power plan of software? And maybe the advisors jump in to do a bit of research, but really it's more or less the power plan of software. They're the ones who are in that tool. They're using a day-to-day. It's complex, but it's okay because that's all they do and they get it. Um, and then you'll have the advisors who... Maybe they aren't even doing the research or maybe they're doing the research in conjunction with the power planner and they barely need to go in there at all. The support team don't need to go into a tool like that at all. They can use anything else. Um, so you've got that trade-off there. Do we want to have one tool that does everything and maybe isn't the best at everything but um, is really good at power planning in particular and research um, or do we want to have them as just completely standalone tools and that means we need to push data or pull data from one to the other um, if that's even possible uh, and in some cases it's not or we may need to translate data from one to the other um, and it, that really does depend on the style and scale of the business how technical are your advisors how much are they doing this DIY if the advisors are heavily involved all the way through the process um, then one tool would be a little bit more suitable. If you've got very clearly delineated teams or if indeed you outsource your power planning to an external provider and you don't really care how long it takes, then you might be more inclined to do the standalone um, CRM that's not really necessarily an advice-focused tool um, but is a very powerful tool because it's a CRM and that's all it does and it's Silicon Valley backed and, and all that jazz. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. And I think a lot of what you were saying in that in, in that pros, in that conversation was – or the idea of understanding the functionality of every single system because a lot of the time the functionality of the system is for, like you said, a power planner or for an advisor and um, mm. you know, we're, trying to, we're trying to jump between the two or we're, or we're not using the functionality to its fullest. Especially if two-thirds of the users don't even use the core functionality of that tool, then you start wondering, should this be two tools or is this the, the best way to have it set up? And maybe it is. There is a lot of value, genuine, real value of having everything in one spot. It's not just the, you know, the old school way of doing things that it's very useful to have things all in one spot. Yeah. Um, and especially when you start getting at really high levels of investment in terms of you know, a business that's maturing, that's scaling and stuff like that, then some of those tools can be really good. So if, you're, if your dreams are really big um, and or you are at that level of scale, then the software that might be best for you might be one of those all-in-one solutions because that really high levels of investment around your systems, your process, supporting, coding, and things like that, those tools can work really well. 
Uh, you know, honestly, I still haven't seen a better document produced than a well-invested X-Plan site um, that's got deep support built into it, that has relatively simple processes that underpin it uh, and has that level of investment that's been done really, really well. Um, but not a lot of practices can do that, and that's just not realistic for where a lot of people want to go. Um, so if you're looking at something that's a little bit more modest than than that, and you're not going to ever really have that budget of you know 100 grand plus to invest over a couple of years in really deeply building your stuff out, then some of those other tools or splitting out those tools starts to make more sense. Yeah, it's certainly a difficult one when the price tag gets up to that range. Um, yep. Talk to me about client portals. A lot, there's a lot of um, going on at the moment with regards to you know sharing of sharing of data and documents and storing stuff in one place. What what are you seeing hmm. in the client portal space? So one, I'm continuing to see lots of people try client portals and not have them work out. Um, and the reasons I think that that is the case is one, um, under investment. So they expect it's going to solve everything and it it just can't. But also try under investing in how much effort the clients are going to have to go through and how much support you're going to have to give clients to engage an online client portal. So if you're looking at one of those solutions that really can do so much and does everything, um, most of the financial planning CRMs that have a portal are potentially very powerful. Um, the dedicated portal tools like a My Prosperity or a MoneySoft, they can benefit from a lot of investment. But if you just plug and play and you just say, hey, everybody, here's, here's a login, please log in here, use the client portal, there it is, you can go and enter your data there if you want to, then no one's going to do that because no one wants to log into another thing. And they don't necessarily trust this tool. It's not in your website. It's clearly through something else, even though it might have your logo at the top and it might have your colors. People are smarter than that, they can tell. So you know, they're going to be going through a pretty jarring experience. Where I think it can work well is when you either invest really heavily, and the example I use for that is always the major banks. Um, so if you have, if you bank with CBA and you've been trying to get to speak to a teller for the last five years, you've probably gotten spear tackled somewhere in between by somebody saying, what are you doing? The app can do that for you. If the app can't do it, the ATM can do it for you. Please don't speak to a teller. And I swear they have KPIs based on failing every time somebody gets to a teller. That's the amount of effort that is required because you need to then start saying to people, I'm not emailing you the SOA. I'm uploading the SOA to your secure client portal. That's where you access it. You can't fill out a fact find. It's not safe. It's not efficient. It's not easy. You need to take the little bit of pain today to work it through the client portal. If you want to sit with one of our team, you can book 15 minutes with our admin person. They'll set up a Zoom with you and they'll step you right through everything that you need to do. Or we can do it at the start of your next appointment or whatever it is. We'll take the effort to help you, but that is how it's done. And that requires substantial effort and ongoing effort um, because if you don't do that, people just won't use it. If the easiest thing for them to do is to email you, then they will. So if you have a really narrow use case, that can be the other alternative that maybe doesn't require quite so much investment and can work as a stepping stone. So if you use it just as a fact-finding tool or just as a document storage tool, we don't want you to email us documents that's not secure. We want you to upload them to your secure client portal. That's what this is here to do. Um, it might be this is just for managing your portfolio. And this just is so you have visibility over your portfolio, what's in your account, your partner's account, and your SMSF's account, all in one spot. That's all this thing does. It's not trying to do 50 things. And then you expand it one by one by one. You start with the secure uploads, perhaps, and then maybe it's Here's also where you're going to receive the FSG and acknowledge privacy. And then the next thing is, this is where we're doing data collection for you and so on and so forth. Then after you've been expanding that out slowly, slowly, you can then start saying, well, we're now doing everything on here. We're not going to do things the, the way we used to. Um, and that can be really challenging to get to and takes time. And that's where I see a lot of people have problems, especially when, you know, most practices don't even mandate having an email address. So, you know, if you're going to have all of these exceptions, which may be the right call for your business, I'm not saying it's not, but if you can't even get to the point of, hey, I want to have a bunch of automation built into emails, then looking at an online portal is is a significant extra leap beyond that. 
Yeah, it's an interesting point you make about the uh, the resources, the, the time and resources to actually make it work properly, not just uh, expecting it to work out of the box. Um, um, but- a really important point, though, is when you do do it, it can be really cool. Like you get to see this and, you know, you can see a demo with any of those providers and you go, oh, wow, if we had all their data in there, it would be really good for the clients and be really good for us. It's just how much effort it takes to get there. But I do genuinely believe the rewards are there if you put the effort in. Yep, fantastic. Uh, Pat, thanks so much for coming on to this uh, particular episode. We look forward to catching you in the next one where we talk about tech trends. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks. Welcome, Hayley Pierce. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us in this series. Now, do you want to give the listeners a very quick overview of just your business at the moment? Uh, my name is Hayley Pierce, and I am an advisor and the operations manager at Caboodle Financial Planning. Uh, we operate virtually and we connect with other financial planning practices to help them segment their client database and take over their C and D clients. Yeah, amazing. So there's a lot there's a lot going on uh, with you and what you're doing and obviously in the, the, the technology and innovation space. So I'm uh, very keen to jump into this conversation with you. Uh, let's start with tech stacks in this, this idea that we all have and we, we're all implementing so many different pieces of technology. Tell us about your 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 tech stacks from when you're you know both bringing on new clients and we'll probably work all the way through to to the end when you're servicing clients but let's start with a new client yeah so because we don't market to consumers we we i guess market to other financial planning practices we use a tool called zoho analytics very similar to power bi if anyone sees something like that it's uh, helps you segment data analyze data represented in different formats and we use that to collate the analyze the list of clients that a, a another pro, another advisor might be looking to um, you know remove from from their books. Given the level of compliance and the changes within in the industry, it's normal that they'd want to focus on a segment of their clients, and they ultimately want to be able to make sure that those other people that they can't service any longer are looked after and. These analytical tools allow us to segment who they are, the type of products they have, the revenue that we might receive from those clients. Um, we do also use that at an operational level throughout the business. Fantastic. So that's just for new businesses coming on when you bring a book in and, and you're able to then look through. Where do you, like, that's all, to me, that sounds like structured data you're looking for. How do you, how does the tool, I guess, go and do all that? It requires a lot of input. So like any system, you have to have be able to put good data in to get great data out. Um, so our chairman, Warwick, he puts a lot of effort into drawing information from commission systems, from whatever CRM the advisor is using, uh, compiling it. Um, Warwick is an actuarial <laughs> by trade, so he understands how all of these things work. But a tool is like Zoho Analytics is there to help people who don't have an actuarial degree to be able to use pivot tables and graphs to segment demographics of client bases, um, you know, bands of revenue, things like that. So it, it just helps us analyze how we're going to approach this particular portfolio when it comes on. Yeah, amazing. And so then does that information travel into your CRM or do you, how does that get into you? Is it, or is Zoho your CRM? Yeah, so uh, our CRM is is Zoho. So Zoho One is, um, I guess, the best way to describe it is sort of like the Google of CRMs. Uh, it has its own calendar functionality. It's got a CRM. It's got a signature facility, forms, surveys, eBooks. It's got you name it. It's got everything. Um, and yeah, so the, the data that we we source out of Zoho Analytics then feeds straight into our CRM which then allows us to begin our onboarding process. So introducing the client to Caboodle and welcoming them on as the client. Oh, so this is really interesting. So the, um, the CRM itself has all these, well, plugins for, for a better word, but they already, they're already there. Um, yep. So you're not, trying to, um, you're not trying to make systems talk to each other, which is, a, which is great. Talk to us about your onboarding process and what other um, sort of technology and, and stack information you, you're using. Yeah, so the onboarding process is really the client's chance to get to know us. Um, sometimes they're not in love with the idea that they've been transferred to another advisor that operates virtually. So we do have to use a lot of engagement tools to connect with these people and, and build that trust. Um, we use a lot of video. So um, where uh, we so we do use ScreenFlow, which is uh, allows us to record videos. Uh, it also allows us to add captions. Now that's just a, it's a paid application, uh, but it's very high quality. There are many free tools you can use like Loom um, that allow you to put to get together videos to be able to share 
in email templates, things like that. Um, so we have an onboarding process where we send out a series of emails um, instead of hammering them with heaps of info about Caboodle all at once. Often the change makes people, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of information. So stepping it out over a period of time allows them to get to know each member of the team, how we can service them. And we also use that opportunity to set up the next 12 months, what that will look like. They'll know exactly when they're going to hear from us and in what format they're going to hear from us. Uh, we largely do that via email, as I said, using videos, things like that. Um, but in some instances where they don't have email, we just pop a good old fashioned letter in the post. Yeah, amazing. So um, talk to me about these these videos. So are some of the videos just, um, here's one we prepared earlier, like, like a welcome to Caboodle, or are some of them personalised? Uh, we, we do personalise ones at review stage. So in the initial phase, it's um, we, Webinar Ninja is the tool we use actually, and that's often the client guide as well as the two advisors. So myself and one of the other advisors we have, um, we, we think it's important that the clients coming on board know that yes, they have their advisor, but there's a team of people at Caboodle that can pick up and help them whenever that they need. Um, so we use that with the three of us to be able to welcome, I guess, in a general way to Caboodle. And then, as I said, at review time, but much more personalised. Yeah, incredible. So um, just on, if, if you're taking over an advisor's book, let's say, you know, you were taking over a book from me as the, as the, as the mock advisor in this conversation, um, then... Would I do a video with you? How does that work? Definitely. So we've used tools like Zoom, Google Meet. Uh, Webinar Ninja is our favourite because it sets you up with a template uh, layout and you can just use that every single time. Uh, minimal editing, it, it spits out a, a, a file that you can just attach or upload to YouTube and it's really nice and simple. Um, and, yeah, we, we have, a, I guess, a bit of a structure where we talk to the previous advisor so they give their chance to explain why the transfer is occurring and, and give that transfer of trust. Yeah, amazing. And so um, so this this all gets sent to the client because obviously you got their email. How, is that how you send it? Do you send it yep. by email or is it sent, um, is there a portal or is it? No, we just embed that in an email to them. That way we can keep an eye on the analytics, check out whether they've watched it. Um, if they haven't, then we make extra attempts. So uh, that email is always followed up with a phone call uh, to welcome them. But if we're not getting any response, then we just try harder. Um, and that's not in a pressuring sense. It's it's important that the client understands that we're now their advisor and why that's occurred. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so do you have a workflow or a template then that sets up, that automates that stuff if they don't open? Yeah, so Zoho CRM is really good in that way that you can set up automation. Um, so, that, yeah, there's a series of tasks and we have uh, a new portfolio process for each client. So we can see where they're up to, where they got to in the process and as soon as one thing happens, then the next thing is triggered. So it, it all automatically happens and our client guide just needs to keep an eye on where this person is up to within that process. Yep. And how do you work out when the reviews are going to happen within that within that process? Uh, yeah, so we have within the first three to four months, we schedule their first review. Uh, clients don't usually like to wait too much longer than that. Um, we also have a, a six monthly check in service. So, as well as their review, where we pop them an email or a phone call just to see how they're going, you know, any questions, anything we can help with. Um, so, they're aware of that constant contact. Um, and we set those contact months right at the beginning. As soon as they join us, we set the review months and those two contact months. And every month we just run a list of who's due to be contacted for whatever reason this month and then that automation commences. Yeah, incredible. So because obviously you run a uh, – where you're working in a practice where there's a lot of clients. As you mentioned, you're bringing a lot of uh, what, what's referred to as C&D class clients yeah. and you bring them in. So you've got to, you, you've got to basically – work at scale in a lot of cases. Talk to me about that um, that review process around how does that work with, um, you know, obviously contacting them, how much time do you can personally get to spend with them versus what's automated? Absolutely. So um, when you take over C&D clients, they're not one type of client. Um, most financial planners will, will target a niche and they like to be contacted or communicated with in a similar way. We have all different types of clients. There's some of them are elderly, some of them are young, and we really have to be able to segment our each each part of our process to suit that type of person. So, um, for the people that do have email and are high engagement, we know that if we send them a link and 
to, to book their review call that they'll book it in. We don't need to follow up with a phone call. But then there are the people that are notorious not responders and we have those people tagged accordingly. They need phone calls. They needed a follow-up SMS, things like that. But then we also have the post-only people and their review invitation needs to go out sort of two weeks before their review is actually due because the post takes so long at the moment. We also segment out people that have communication challenges. So if there's a language barrier, a hearing barrier, um, if they have a power of attorney, we then segment that particular process a different way. So the CRM has really allowed us to dive into the different streams of clients we have and then tailor how we deliver our service to those people. Um, when it comes to booking review calls, um, we've got someone that does that and doesn't take too long. As I said, we really utilise automation to to encourage people to book in their review call. But where where that doesn't happen, then we just we follow them up with a phone call. Well, fantastic! Uh, so much so much to unpack in that. Uh, Hallie, really <laughs> appreciate you uh, coming on this particular episode. Uh, we look forward to catching you in the next episode when we're talking about tech trends. Welcome, James Sutherland. Hey, Fraser. How are you going, bro? Very well. Thank you for coming on this episode. Now, the, for the listeners uh, out there at the moment, just give us, a, give us a quick overview of exactly what you're doing and how you're working with businesses at the moment. I love the word you use, uh, exactly. So I'm doing two roles at the moment. I'm doing compliance uh, with a particular um, AFSL, which has been fun. And also on the uh, part, other part of my business is reviewing other AFSLs uh, and licensees, um, the smaller ones, tech stacks, and what they're, how they're uh, managing their tech, because as you know, it's a changing um, beast on almost on a daily basis these days. Yeah, absolutely, and it probably leads nicely into the to the topic of this particular episode, where we are talking about tech stacks and and what you're seeing and what's available and what's coming on. Um, let's start with uh, what you're seeing out there in the in the space of say pre. Pre-client engagement, let's start in that space and then move through the, the, the advice journey. But before somebody becomes a client, um, there's all sorts of plugins and bits and pieces. What are you seeing out there? Yeah, well, if we're talking about um, you thinking more around the uh, electronic fact find process or, yeah, or more so the uh, the marketing and branding. The and, marketing yeah, branding, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, COVID's changed a lot of, sp- a lot of areas in this space um, with people doing bookings online, Calendly, et cetera. Um, and I'm getting that sort of invitation more often now and uh, get, sending out of FSGs or having FSGs online, et cetera. Uh, so I think, I think practices have embraced it now with the expectation they can't see the client face-to-face and do the preamble. The gathering up of information using Dropbox, um, one practice I'm using is using SharePoint, so giving clients access to SharePoint um, pre-meeting, and obviously, as, as I said earlier, the um, online fact finds. Yeah, fantastic. And what about the um, the website stuff? The, what are you seeing coming down into your website? Uh, the updating of websites or yeah, the, just, the, just the documentation with, on websites? Just with with how websites have changed over time, so now they're a lot more a lot more. Um, uh, a lot more goes on on the website, I guess. A lot more research goes on from the from the client, so therefore, a lot more information is being, uh, or a lot more value is being put into websites. Yeah, well, there's two schools of thought. There's those that that are exactly that with regards to having more um, information as possible on websites, and certainly I'm seeing that and working with with firms that do. There's uh, another school of thought where you just make your website as simple as possible because what is it any more than 5.67 seconds or something and you're done anyway. So, cause I think people, clients, it appears to me are using more that who are you and what are you and using things like LinkedIn, Facebook, the Twitter, Instagram, particularly nowadays. Um, and maybe in some instances, um, TikTok. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting, yeah, the old influencer. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Cause I think uh, you're right. You know, uh, there is this concept of, you know, actually having less on your website. I think it's a story brand. It talks about that too, in yes. a lot of ways, just, just making it tell us exactly, you know, as if the clients logged on exactly what they need to know uh, without, without going into all the guff. Yeah. We could name a couple of firms that do that quite nicely. Um, and then when you go into the other bigger firms, I can't remember their names, but it's just this. I was on there the other day, and it's this massive site. It's page after page after page. And you, it's almost like going into Google, and you just get get lost in the details. 
Yep. Yep. Fantastic. And so you, did you say you had a couple of names of firms that, uh, or a couple of websites that you thought were, were quite clever in that space of just being nice and simple and straightforward? Oh, well, I think Fox and Hare do it really nicely. And Benny Nash does too with Pivot. I think those yep. two firms, if you, if you want to look at a, a fairly simple sort of site that's, that hasn't got a gazillion pages, do yourself a favour and go to those two sites. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Now, t- t- tell us about, you mentioned the online fact find. Talk, tell us about the process during the advice process, um, the tech stacks that you're seeing around there that people are using really well when it comes to the actual advice process, getting the information in, um, at working clients through that advice process. Well, there are a couple of tools that are out there that are trying to do the pre-explain type of stuff. And as you know, over the years, I haven't been a, a big fan of explain. I will say, though, I'm actually changing my mind um, now working with more, more practice. I'm actually changing my mind slightly on that. And I think Explain's changed their mind as to where they sit too. But from a fact-find point of view, there are some nice little um, integrations that are now starting to occur with companies like um, Raw, for example. Um, and I think um, Patty's company, because his name escapes me. If I see it. Uh, yes. Evolution. Yeah, Vice Evolution. Thank you very much, Rose. And uh, so they are starting to make some inroads, and I'm seeing people saying, oh, I've heard about these guys. What can we use for regards to fact finds? Because it's that, it's that moving back and forth because clients don't want to do the start, what's your name, what's your address, particularly if we already have it. So my attitude's always been complete what you complete and then ask the client what the latest information is. Because um, clients are time poor just as much as advisors are client at time poor so let's try and make it easier on both um, particularly the client because you know make it easier to do business with where an interactive fact find allows clients to get that information that is expected not to be known by the advisor Yep, and I can I can see this. You 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 wear your compliance hat as well as your, you know, your <laughs> client hat in this in this space. So it's it's a bit of coming from both uh, both directions. Sure. Um, what about uh, what about once you're getting into the process and you've done some, you know, uh, you've, you you may be trying to produce SOAs or anything like that. Oh, the document generation is that a whole new subject or what? <laughs> it's all part of the it's all part of the tech stack, surely. Oh God, document generation. Yes, I think that's the bane of every financial practices. It's the roadblock, so so to speak, trying to get a document out that's succinct enough, um, I'm going to use the word pretty enough, um, take that for what you want, um, and dare I say quick enough, as quick a time as possible is where the firms I talk to, that's their biggest problem, generating advice documents in an efficient way that doesn't need too much post work. So as much, get it as right as possible the first time and then spend as little time as possible with the intricacies, um, given the fact of the formatting of, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's X plan or advisor logic or midwinter, et cetera, they still need post work. They still need time spent on it. So how much time does one want to spend on that, I suppose, or what does the firm need to spend on that? Yep. And, uh, and just with that, um, that post work or that time, what, what are you seeing out there as sort of, I mean, I've, I've heard average times going into days and weeks, but what, what are you seeing sort of as an efficient process for a good generation of SIs? I've heard the same thing, days and weeks. Yeah. From go to way, it, it can be days to weeks, depending where you're, where you're up to, absolutely. Um, uh, it's that, that post period I'm seeing um, an efficient way, probably five hours. I'm seeing an efficient way, inefficient, probably up to two days. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's it is it is a long time. Uh, now, talk to us about um so that the technology stacks in that space. Uh, what, what are you seeing with regards to plugins and those sorts of things that are working well? Well, I think people are starting to use Microsoft Suite a lot more now, that particularly with COVID again, when you've got Teams on there, you've got your SharePoints, you've got um, your other applications, Word, etc. The utilising of those Text. Um, and then you've got your, your Google Suites, and I'm seeing there's a combination of both those. Yes, yes, I've certainly, uh, I've certainly used both. You'll certainly use both. You got any preferences? Uh, I don't. I used to. I used to be very pro Google, but um, yeah, with, with uh, the firms that I've been working with, uh, they've had a fair bit of integration with regards to Microsoft. And Microsoft, I think, is a lot more user friendly today than it was, say, five, even six years ago. Uh, and I think. Google has made them become a lot more user-friendly 
you know, and, I, and finally they've got teams working in a half decent way, although it still has its limitations. Uh, and we're using uh, both teams, you and I are on Zoom today for very other various other reasons. And Chrome's now got their, have they rebranded Meet? Have they, they've changed yeah, something Google, else. Google have, uh, have updated their Meet. Uh, yes. Google yeah. Hangout or whatever it used to be called. Well, it used to be Hangouts. Then it changed it to Meet and now they've changed it to something else. Yeah. Client portals, what, what are you seeing in that space? Uh, in regards to, just explain that to me. Yeah, so advisors using client portals, um, I think, which is probably a, a fairly uh, a new thing, I guess. Um, you know, used to be a lot of um, software provider client portals, but now there tends to be a lot of, um, like you said, the SharePoint type. Yeah, uh, so yeah. going. the drop boxes, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think, Advice, advice terms are using those a lot more. You know, you could rattle off four or five different uh, online documentation repositories. Is that the right word? Repositories is a good word. Let's use that. <laughs> uh, and, and giving clients access. So, you know, one of the firms we're using is they've, um, uh, if they can't find the PDS they want from a, from a portal, from a product provider, they will, up, but they will give the client access to the particular address on SharePoint yep. for them to get there, particularly some of those older PDSs. We had an issue the other day where an advice center was trying to find a 2000 and, uh, 2009, I think it was, PDS from AMP, and they couldn't find it online. Yeah, no, there's, there's, it's, it's an interesting one. I think also e- email, we're starting to realize that email is not very secure for sending t- these types of things, and, and these these share, share drives and share portals are becoming increasingly uh, more and more increasingly used. Yes, yeah, with people hacking systems, etc. Yeah, there's certainly uh, certainly a lot of that around. Uh, James, is there anything else that you're seeing in the in the in the tech stack space that you find uh, fairly exciting? Well, we've got well, the, the one one last thing we may need to talk about a little bit is the um, goals, c- getting goals and aspirations from clients because that's not part of that is part of fact find obviously, and then you've got different companies using different things. The go tos like Astute Wheel. Uh, well, Fin 365 has some, some goals, engine, goals engine in there. There are a couple that just spring to mind. Yeah, fantastic. And um, and you've seen them being used in in uh, fairly well. I have, yes, yeah. They um, the people who use them swear by them, and it is a good way to to be able to draw down, you know, what are the client's objectives both now and today. Because as you know, with um, Fascia Standard Two. Funny how that rattles off the top of your mind. Um, where you know the ramifications of advice today and in the future is now something that advisors are going need to give more thought to, and having short term, medium term, long term goals helps with regards to showing what the advice is today can benefit them in the future and the reasoning why. Yeah, this is an interesting, I guess, trend which we'll get to in the next episode. But that that concept around you know the. Uh, the the astute wheels, the Lumion, the My Prosperity, the the Fin three six five, those sort of front end conversational um, tools. Yes, yeah. How could I forget Lumion? <laughs> so, no worries. Sorry, Santi. Uh, uh, hey, James. Thanks for coming on to this particular episode. We we'll look forward to catching you in the next one. We'll be discuss tech trends. Ah, oh, I look forward to it. Thanks, man. See you later. Welcome to the conversation, Cara Graham. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, to, let's give uh, start with a quick overview of your business and the size of your practice at the moment. Yeah, so uh, my name's Cara Graham. I'm from TWB Australia, and we're we're based over here in Perth. Although we do have, um, a, I guess, a branch in the in Sydney. I am a director in the business, but my main role really is working directly with clients as an advisor. We currently work with, I should know this number off the top of my head, but I'm going to say about 350 different clients, might be a little bit higher now uh, from there, but we tend to have a pretty loyal client base and and we're also just regularly meeting new people and bringing on new clients as well. Yeah, fantastic. So it's a larger business. It's, uh, as you said, uh, TWD Australia? TWD Australia, yeah. So the majority of our advisors are in Perth uh, and we just have one advisor in Sydney currently. Yeah, fantastic and uh, well, wonderful, wonderful award-winning business, let's say. Yes, yes. 
Uh, fantastic. Now let's have a let's have a quick chat about uh, tech stacks. Uh, you know, obviously mm. the, your technology is a big part of the process of everything you've done. As I mentioned before, you've won a lot of awards, uh, and the, and technology has certainly been a part of that uh, journey for you guys. Uh, what sort of technology or stacks are you using um, with with your clients before you know, say you know the prospecting type marketing, um, you know, website type stuff? Yeah. Well, I'll have to admit. Get um, really that involved in the website side of things. I think as an advisor, I try to steer clear of that and just focus on what I know. Um, but you know, most of our clients come to us from other clients or from uh, you know other advisors, so accountants and, and brokers and things along those lines. So we are predominantly a word of mouth business. Um, you know, and that that has worked exceptionally well for us in the past. When we do get an introduction, then we use Zeppo. We use the Zeppo sales app to, to track any new leads um, and opportunities. Um, we've been using that for the last few years, and that's been really great just to get some, I let's just call it some firmer numbers around what was happening. You know, I think like a lot of people, you know, it's very easy to just use, it, say, a spreadsheet to sort of track these things. And then when you want to try and look deeper into the numbers and say, well, where did this come from? You know, what referral sources are really paying off? Um, how good is, you know, my conversion versus my colleague's conversion? Um, then the spreadsheet just wasn't cutting it. So Zeppo Sales App has been really good in that regard. You know, it's relatively easy to use. Um, and, you know, it, it's probably more just about, um, I guess, rubbish in, rubbish out. So just making sure that we've got some uniformity amongst all of our advice in terms of what they enter and how they enter it from there. But that's been really useful. Um, another technology tool that we've been using for the last couple of years in terms of you know booking things in has been Calendly. Um, I, I think I came across Calendly maybe about two years ago at one of the AFA conferences. I went to um, a presentation and one of the guys was talking about this and that has been a really good addition to our business. You know, just automating the client's ability to sort of take control of the diary, book in, reschedule if they need to. Um, it also gives us some good control. You know, I can, uh, you know, really just set, okay, you know, I'm quite um, busy at the moment, so I can just set, okay, I'm not going to have any initial meetings for, say, another two months because I'm at capacity just dealing with some of the things I'm, I've got on at the moment. And so that's been great. Um, we rolled that out amongst our, across our business probably about a year ago. So we've got all the advisors and associates on it now. Um, and it's just streamlined things, you know, no more manual meeting confirmations, no more having to manually go back and check with clients that they're coming. Um, so that's been, that's been excellent. And then probably the other tool we use at that sort of pre-stage is a digital questionnaire. Um, we've currently got that with advisor forms and um, we've just had a couple of issues with it so far just in terms of, I guess, the ease of things merging into XLAN, which is sort of the main client management system that we use. So we're just revisiting a few of those hurdles and trying to work out a couple of kinks in the process. Um, but generally speaking, if the digital form doesn't work, then we revert to the good old PDF form <laughs> that clients can type in as well. Yeah, the good old that was a that was a stroke of technology back in its day. Um, <laughs> it's it's super important with referrals. That first sort of area you talked about. Uh, did you say the Zeppo sales app? Sales app, yeah. So yeah. um, so yeah, that's sort of a particular portion of the Zeppo. That's just the sales sales app tracking. Yeah, and uh, and and does that mean? Can you just run me through quickly how that works practically? Is that does the does the accountant or the referrer get? that information? Can they, can they visibly see where that leads up to or is it? I believe you can set that up. We don't currently have that set up in the business. So essentially there's sort of two halves of it. We've got the leads. So if somebody mentions to me, hey, I gave your name to Joe Blogs today, they're going to give you a call or, um, you know, you should give them a call and I'll enter, enter those into the lead section. And then once I've had a chat with them or once I've booked it in, then it goes over to opportunities. And then within the opportunities, we have a bit of a timeline. So we can sort of have, you know, pre-meeting, at meeting stage, preparing our proposal, waiting for acceptance. So at any point, I can look at what have I got on the go? What have we got on the go as a practice? Um, you can really sort of curate it to have what you want. So, you know, we at our weekly advisor meetings, 
Um, we have everything from Zeppo flows into Power BI, and then Power BI we've sort of been able to kind of manage and almost kind of design exactly what we want to see, you know, what's useful. So we can look at it and say, okay, how many outstanding proposals have we got? How much possible new business have we got that might be coming in, say, this month or next month? Um, and, you know, again, looking, breaking it down by referral source, breaking it down by advisor, um, you know, and just looking at all of the stats, which has been, been really useful. And I don't know, I sort of keep having this, um, I'll call it a problem where, um, you know, people take ages to respond to a proposal and then they all come back at once. So I had like a few in the pipeline and it seemed like everyone was just taking their time accepting. And then just last week alone, I had three clients accept their proposals. So, you know, when it kind of when it um, rains, it pours. Yep. Yeah, it's a, like you said, it's a problem, not a problem, but a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, fantastic, fantastic. So the, uh, t- tell me more about how you use Power BI. That's just in the internal process around looking at that or do you use that across other, I mean, with the, the sales app or is the Power BI used in other areas as well? We use it uh, on the, the new client side of things and then we also use it to track how many meetings and appointments each of our advisors and associates are having. So um, one of our sort of key pack sort of key KPIs for our client facing staff is um, is I guess what we might call FaceTime, you know, time spent with clients or uh, referral partners. And so we can use that to, you know, track week by week, how are people tracking in terms of their meeting targets? Are they spending enough FaceTime in front of people where we want them to um, from there? And again, that's been, that's been really useful as well. Yeah. And just, you know, being able to do that Sort of digitally as opposed to manually has been a bit of a bit of a game changer as well. Yeah, wow. Uh, t- talk to me about the the actual advice process itself. Is there a, what are you using with technology once your sort of clients become engaged and they want to uh, and they want to become clients uh, during the whole advice process? So we use XPlan quite a lot, which I I don't know the proportions of what advisors tend to use. You probably know more than me, but we use that pretty heavily amongst the advice process. So. You know, some of the tools within XPlan Risk Research are well solver and X tools um, for looking at any sort of product, insurance or, or modelling um, from there. That's probably the main sort of tool that we use in the advice process. You know, we've sort of looked and dabbled into into a few others, but, but I guess from our point of view, um, it just feels like XPlan has sort of got the technology there at the sort of best stage and the sort of most accessible stage so far. One of the downsides that we have noticed, um, say on the wealth solver side, which is looking at say things like super funds, is that a few newer funds uh, aren't listed on there. So, you know, we've had a few clients come through which say a bit more technology, you know, technology focused and they want to look at say some of the micro investing apps like Raise or Spaceship, um, you know, and they're not on there. I also had another client who, um, he works in marketing and he works with a business called Superhero, which is, again, a slightly newer fund, and they're not on there. So, you know, I think that they're good, but they've probably got a way to go to keep up with the market. It just seems like there's a lot of new products and a lot of new offerings coming through, um, and uh, they, they're just sort of, you know, when they're not on there, we have to go back to manual, which is obviously really frustrating and just fraught with error, we tend to find um, from there as well. So. Explains, you know, pretty kind of major tool. We use Zeppo from a task management point of view. So just sort of tracking, you know, the team. Um, we've got a pretty big team. There's about 30 of us all up. So, you know, we just sort of try to spread the load between the, uh, from the administration to the advice preparation side of things. So Zeppo can sort of help there just managing the project. Um, and then, you know, I think like a lot of us, we've really moved quite a lot onto using Zoom for the delivery side of things as well. Um, you know, say pre-COVID, we occasionally use Skype for some of the clients that were over east, you know, even often just had a meeting over the phone, um, you know, for clients that were over east versus now. Uh, I've been genuinely surprised that after that COVID period, we just gave our clients the option and said, do you want to keep doing Zoom? Do you want to come into the office? Um, and I've been genuinely surprised that, you know, certain clients, say like younger people, for example, they went, no, I want to come into the office. And then older people that, that just said, no, you know what, Zoom's really convenient. Um, you know, I don't have to travel in. I don't have to, 
you know, wear proper pants. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just jump online and then I can get, you know, get back to goal for, you know, go and, um, go and do something fun straight away afterwards. So we're using that more and more. I would probably say at least half of my meetings are over Zoom these days. Um, you know, some weeks, some weeks even more. And even, you know, some, um, sometimes if, um, you know, you've got a tickle in the throat or you, you're just not feeling 100%, then again, it's a really easy switch to say, well, let's just do Zoom and make sure everybody, you know, is safe and protected and we're not, you know, um, uh, you know, putting anybody in a vulnerable position as well. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. Tell, me, tell me about um, client portals. Do you use a client portal or are you using the explain one? We use the X-Plan one predominantly, um, but we don't get great feedback on it <laughs> from our clients. Um, we also, um, uh, I guess, depending on what investments the client has, then we sometimes use the, the, the portals offered by them. So um, at the moment, we're predominantly, uh, we, well, we sort of were working with Wealtho2 quite a bit, but we're in a project to transition across to net wealth for, for a, a huge amount of clients. And that also is moving across to the net wealth portal as well. Um, you know, we're probably about maybe 50% through that project at the moment. And, and, you know, so far there have been a few hurdles, but the portal has been received pretty well. Um, you know, clients are really liking the ability to just have it, you know, in an app on their phone, be able to access it on the go. You know, even me as an advisor, you know, there's access on the advisor app. And so I can jump on, I can see my clients, I can show them in the meeting how the app works and, you know, what they can see from a portfolio perspective. So that's been a huge um, benefit. And I think it'll be even better once we've completed the project. Um, we, you know, I think x does have some advantages that you can capture sort of, you know, some different accounts, but we just haven't had great feedback from clients in terms of some of the accessibility. The website's a bit clunky. They always are getting logged out and getting their, you know, um, their password sort of um, turned off. And yeah, I would probably say literally the meeting I just had before this, the client said, yeah, can you reset my password again? Um, I think she says at every meeting. So, um, you know, I think it'll be good to, to you know, get onto the network platform, which is just a bit more, um, I guess, you know, a little bit more up to date with the times. You know, it's kind of giving people what they want in a format that's nice and accessible and and visually pleasing as well. You know, everything on there looks so smooth and um, and beautiful, whereas I think, you know, X-Plan, they have updated a few things along the way, but it just all still feels a little bit clunky um, to me. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you for coming on, Cara, and sharing your tech stack information. Um, and secure, it's always a tough one with security and logging out, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, <laughs> we, we want security, but we want it easy. So it's sort of a, it's a very tricky one. Uh, we'll catch you very soon. Welcome to this episode, Matt Heiner. Thanks very much, Fraser. Great to be on the show. Fantastic to have you here. Now, uh, you're, of course, uh, the Joint Managing Director of NetWealth. Uh, give us a quick overview of what that means. That's a good question. I wonder about that on a daily basis, actually. Uh, so as you mentioned, um, Joint Managing Director at NetWealth, um, as you'd imagine, I'm involved in every aspect of the business. Um, been at the business now for over 20 years and have a particular passion uh, for product, sales, marketing, and obviously technology. Fantastic. Now we know you're uh, you're a lover of all things technology and, and innovation, so a perfect person to be talking to on this particular series. Uh, we're we're covering off on tech stacks, uh, in in particular, sort of talking about uh, both the before, you know, the before and advice, uh, the prospect type clients. Uh, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, over the last couple of years with COVID, uh, new business has been a little bit challenging. Um, so clearly, uh, pre-COVID, uh, new business was largely done face to face and. With everything that's gone on, advisors have had to really adapt to uh, how they're onboarding clients, how they're finding clients, uh, and that's really sort of changed, I guess, a lot of the the marketing uh, angles uh, or the marketing spend in some cases as well for for advice firms. So uh, we're seeing content marketing becoming uh, increasingly popular, uh, and and that is because it is extremely effective. Uh, We're seeing advisors using more digital tools, uh, clearly Zoom, Teams um, and other video conferencing tools are now just part of life when it comes to seeing new clients. Um, But we're also seeing um, social media channels being used far more frequently as a way of keeping in touch with existing clients, but also promoting their brand and their content online. Um, And I was really interested to see in um, our recent Advice Tech report 
that we're also seeing in some cases, and admittedly it's still a small amount of firms, um, but some advice tech firms, so those are the best firms that are using technology incredibly effectively for real business outcomes, are spending upwards of $5,000 a month on Facebook advertising. Uh, which I thought was staggering. So it's great to see the advice community really starting to leverage some of the, the digital tools and, and channels out there to, to find new business. It's almost like uh, they're starting to take it a bit more seriously now these days. A- absolutely. Uh, they're, they're competing with every other business now. Yeah, it's uh, gone to the days when it was only the, the big end of town that would, uh, that would implement that type of strategy. Now a lot of small businesses are, are taking it uh, very seriously. Um, tell us about websites and, and on that online presence from you know all sorts of things through from reviews. How, how important is that? Yeah, w- websites are clearly very important. Our, our lives have been online now for at least 10 years, if not longer, um, and are certainly mainstream. I, I remember actually having this conversation with my brother about 20 years ago uh, where he was convinced that the internet was a passing fad. Uh, so we've clearly moved on from there, and now I think we're just trying to decide if Bitcoin is the, the next passing fad or not. But, uh, look, web- websites are, are important. Um, they are the first impression that many clients will have. Um, they set the tone for that relationship. They te- set the tone for the engagement that you're going to have with future clients. Um, and therefore, it's really important that it, it is a great representation of your brand um, and the level of service that you're going to provide. One of the really um, important things with any website, though, is it needs to be current. Um, there's nothing worse than going to a website and finding that the only content on it um, is old, it's stale, um, that people are still listed on the website that don't work there anymore. Um, and not only is it a bad customer experience um, and doesn't set a good tone for the future meetings, um, but Google also really dislikes them. Um, so Google will make sure that uh, your website doesn't appear on the first page. Uh, they're looking for fresh content. They're looking for uh, websites that are being actively maintained um, because they want to give their customers a great experience and they want to make sure that they can drive traffic to websites that are going to deliver value for, for their end clients. So um, websites are really important. Um, they're a great way, as I mentioned, to uh, position your brand, they're a great way to position you as an expert, uh, particularly if you've got regular content. Um, you know, in the future, and this is really where we see things heading, you know, that the website will be the entrance to the portal or the client portal. So uh, all of the information and the and the digital engagement tools that sit behind it, whether that's through mobile app um, or through an online version of the client portal. Yeah, it's really interesting that uh, actively uh, maintained idea. I mean, I think I used to I heard Tim Timbo Reed once he called it a stagnant pond. Um, just to try and d- dramatic effect to it. Um, but you're right, absolutely right about uh, that regular update. I think when we look at stuff, um, you know, the, your, your index, especially whether it's news or articles or information, it's always about the uh, when was this published. A- absolutely. Um, and the other one that's a, a absolute, um, you know, got to be a key focus is making sure that your website's responsive. Uh, we all live on our mobiles these days um, and we know that there's nothing worse than getting to a website on your mobile uh, from Google, which will also derank you if it's not responsive, um, and then having to sort of expand it and click around and try and find menus as you're navigating. So um, web- websites are really important um, and it's worth spending the money on them. Yeah. Now you mentioned client portals. Tell us a little bit more about how that uh, and, and what you found sort of in the advice tech report. Uh, yeah. So the, the real focus this year for the advice tech report was around client engagement. Uh, and what I was particularly excited about this year was that uh, this is the fifth year we've done the report, but it's the first year that we've actually seen any meaningful changes in the adoption of new technology. And so what I mean by that is that over the last four or five years that we've done the report, the intentions of the industry, so that is what they intend to do over the next 12 to 24 months, have always been high. We intend to adopt a managed account. We intend to adopt a client portal. We intend to use digital tools, uh, but the actual adoption has flatlined. Uh, and it's been a bit disappointing for us, actually. We put a lot of effort into educating the market and explaining why these things are important, but we also understand that it's hard and we understand that everyone's busy. So this year, uh, off the back of COVID, which has really accelerated tech adoption and force change, uh, we've seen really meaningful changes in the type of technologies that firms are adopting. Um, and one of those um, is client portals. So um, I think advice firms are now recognising that as a result of COVID, as a result of the emerging affluent or the millennial market, uh, and also the fact that mainst- um, the digital wealth has gone mainstream, um, that they now have to have a digital presence um, because it's become a non-negotiable. Uh, and that means looking at client portals and looking at ways that they can provide services, access to information and ancillary benefits outside of the typical review process and it's got to be on the mobile and it's got to be on the web because that's where clients live these days. Yeah, exactly right. Um, t- talk to us about the advice process itself during the, you know, uh, uh, planners and advisors providing advice with clients through that process. What what sort of adoption of technology have you seen? 
Yeah, also another really good point, um, and sorry to keep harping on about COVID, but it really has changed the landscape very dramatically. Um, and you know, when we look at the way that we've been living, particularly over the last 18 months, um, it typically takes about 66 days to form a habit or to break a habit. So the way that we've had to live over the last 18 months has formed habits, and those habits aren't going to be easily broken. So I'm not suggesting that we're not going to go back to face-to-face meetings and uh, some of the things that we used to enjoy, like going out for meals and going to the cinema, uh, but we've got to understand that that is going to be heavily augmented now with our digital online uh, life. Uh, And so uh, really when it comes to the advice process, uh, new business will go back to -to face-to-face. We can't wait, and I'm sure advisors can't wait, and I'm sure clients can't wait because it is very difficult to form that bond over Zoom. Uh, But when we surveyed um, a range of Australians in our recent Advisable Australian report, what we found was that whilst that first meeting was very important to be done in person, face-to-face, where possible, from that point on, the behaviours changed quite dramatically and the percentage of clients actually wanting a face-to-face meeting for document signing, reviews, uh, education uh, sessions has actually declined very significantly and they're very happy to receive an email uh, to do it over the phone or to do it over a Zoom meeting. So uh, it's important that we understand what our clients want and that we shouldn't assume what they want. Now, whether you agree with the research that we've done uh, or not, that's fine, but I highly recommend that you actually survey your clients and find out directly from them, how do they want to be serviced? Do they want to come into the office for their six-month review or are they very happy with a half-hour chat online? Uh, because as I mentioned numerous times now, uh, things are changing and we need to adapt uh, and be flexible to how people actually want to uh, interact with us in the future. Yeah, fantastic. I remember, um, I think it was Sam Cawthorn uh, coining the phrase, uh, don't bounce back, bounce forward uh, to the new normal, whatever that's going to be and, and wherever it's going to be. So t- talk to us about the Advisable Australian report. Uh, tell us about that survey. Uh, yeah, that was also a really interesting um, bit of research that we did and it's available on our website. Um, so so first of all, we wanted to try and identify um, out of the whole Australian population, what, what is the real opportunity set for advisors? And then within that broader opportunity set, um, set we we're doing deep dives. So the first one that we did was uh, into the emerging affluent, uh, which is what I like to call millennials with money, uh, and why we think they're a really important subsector of, of the Australian advice community. Uh, and we can come back to that. But more, more broadly, what we found was there's about 2.2 million Australians um, that have got an active advice relationship have had an advice relationship that are open to re-engaging or are looking at engaging an advisor for the first time. So you've got this huge demand for financial advice at a time where advisor numbers are falling. uh, And so we've got this real sort of um, imbalance with supply and demand. Um, So if you're listening and you're thinking about becoming a financial planner, there is no better time to get into the industry. Um, But what it does mean is that advisors and advice firms need to become better at servicing potentially higher numbers of clients or looking at different ways to service lower uh, value clients. Uh, And again, it's challenging, um, but you've got to be really clear on the fact that um, if if we want to make the most of this almost golden opportunity, um, it is going to require change and a a change to value propositions and and how we go about bringing on board new clients and also servicing them. Yeah, you're you're 100%. And um, and it kind of... Um, we, we know these stats are there. We know that there's going to be more and more people looking, uh, less less advisors around. Um, and then in, in the first part of this conversation, we talked about the idea of investing in your website, investing in you know get, you know new business and new people coming in. And um, I guess I guess it could, there's almost a form of apathy there with with around some people going, well, there's going to be lots of people that knocking on the door. Why, why do I need to spend the money on the website? So it's, it's sort of a catch-22, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Matt, for coming on this particular episode. We look forward to catching you in the next episode where we talk about tech trends. Thanks, Fraser. Look forward to it.